Hello everyone, this is Dr. Stevens with a lecture for Unit 3 of Literary Genres. This will be a lecture on the sound of poetry. Let me um, begin just by giving you a list of topics that I want to cover in this lecture um, so that you can follow along and I'll try to indicate uh, at each point during the lecture what particular topic we're talking about. Um, I want to talk about sound in a very general sense, particularly in terms of the relationship between lyric poetry and song. Um, we're going to talk about meter, and I'll explain that uh, when we get to it. I'm going to say a few words about rhyme. Um, we're going to talk about different kinds of meter, so we'll be talking about um, blank verse and free verse, as well as a, two of the prominent forms of meter in uh, English poetry, that is iambic pentameter and iambic tetrameter. Um, I'm going to touch briefly on alliteration, but let's begin by talking about sound in general. Now, one of the reasons that I'm giving this lecture purely in terms of video with, uh, with no um, written documents to go along with, as I do in some of the lectures where I'm not actually looking at a written document, I'm just sitting here talking to you and hoping that you're going to listen, and there are several reasons for that. Um, but the primary reason is that we are talking about sound. So we're not using our eyes, even though I realize that you're using your eyes to look at me. We're not using our eyes, we're using our ears. And there's a very important reason for that. Lyric poetry is very closely related to song. Um, when in the very beginning of literature as we know it, um, when people first started singing songs and writing poems, uh, a poem was accompanied by music. And it was accompanied by an instrument known as a lyre, which is a kind of harp, a stringed instrument. And so the poet would be singing or chanting the poem, the words that is, um, to the accompaniment of this harp, this lyre. And that word is spelled L-Y-R-E. And the word lyre then gives us our uh, contemporary word lyric, L-Y-R-I-C. Now in this course, we use lyric to identify one of the three main genres of literature, that is lyric poetry. But you're also familiar with the word lyrics as in lyrics to a song. And there you have the connection, don't you? All right? The lyrics to a song are the words that are sung. All right? But the singing also involves a tune. It involves music, doesn't it? So a song, when you're listening to a pop song on the radio, when you're singing a song, maybe singing a hymn in church or something like that, you are really going back to the very origins of lyric poetry. That is, you are finding the connection between lyric poetry and sound. Music, of course, being sound. So we're going to talk about some aspects of sound. I need to warn you that sound in poetry is a very complex thing. And I don't mean that it's complex in the sense that it's difficult. I simply mean that there are lots of different aspects of sound, just as when you study music, there are lots of different aspects to music, right? Such as harmony and meter, and structure of a musical piece and so on. Same thing with poetry. There are lots of different aspects of sound and I can't begin to cover all of them in one lecture. I'm not going to try to do that. So we're going to hit upon some of the most important ones. So that then by way of introduction, all right, the connection between poetry as something in words that we read on the page and poetry as something that we hear. Now, you already know that I think it's extremely important that lyric poetry be read aloud. All literature is better if it's read aloud, but poetry in particular, because of the importance of the connection between the sound and the meaning. 
So, here we go. First concept that I want to talk about. I didn't mention this. I don't think I mentioned this in my list of topics that I was going to cover. But the topic is onomatopoeia. Fancy word, big word. You may have heard it before, maybe not. Look at page 587. As a matter of fact, why don't I read that to you? Page 587 in your textbook, if I can see here, um, there is an explanation of onomatopoeia. But let me begin by saying that um, onomatopoeia is a concept that links um, sound with meaning. Okay, that's the general idea. Onomatopoeia means that there is a connection between the sound and the meaning of the words themselves. Okay, so here we are, and you can, um, by the way, uh, this, this is important um, as sort of a reference for this lecture, and that is chapter 11 in the Norton Introduction. Begins on page 587, so um, you can certainly refer to this. Um, if there are things in the lecture that I touch upon that you need further explanation of, please look them up in uh, chapter 11. But um, let's see. So this is uh, toward the end of the short introduction to chapter 11. And it goes like this. Often, this is in the uh, third of three paragraphs in the introduction, but often sound and meaning go hand in hand, and the poet finds words whose sounds echo the action. Well, action could be action, could be something else, but echo the meaning is what they're getting at. A word that captures or approximates the sound of what it describes such as splash or squish or murmur and there are lots of words al along this line like bark 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 okay b-a-r-k as in the sound the dogs make and so on that's an example of onomatopoeia the the word sounds roughly like uh, the bark of a dog right okay and so on or crash all right Crash is a word that approximates the sound of, of something colliding with something else, right? So these words are onomatopoeic words, okay? And the device itself is onomatopoeia, okay? And onomatopoeia simply means that there is a connection between the sound and the meaning. And we'll look at some examples of onomatopoeia as we go along. But the important thing is that regardless of what aspect of sound we're talking about, whether we're talking about rhyme, whether we're talking about rhythm, whether we're talking about the vowel sounds, that's another very important aspect of sound in poetry and so on. Okay, whatever we're talking about, in a really good poem, there will be some kind of way in which that sound supports, echoes, reflects the meaning. Okay? Now, there's a very famous, um, let's see, very, uh, right, page 589, there's a very famous section from a poem by the 18th century poet Alexander Pope. And the, the longer poem is called An Essay on Criticism. And this is a section from the Essay on Criticism. You can find it on page 589, one of the poems that we've uh, assigned for this unit in the course. And so, okay, it begins, uh, it begins on 589 and it's line... 330 begins on line 337 in the essay on criticism. That's why it doesn't begin in, in our text. It doesn't begin with line one because it's an excerpt from an essay on criticism. We're going to look at um, a section on page 590. It's, it's long. I'm not going to read you the whole thing. All right, you can read it to yourself. But it begins on page uh, on line 562. 
And Mr. Pope writes this way. True ease in writing comes from art, not chance. As those move easiest who have learned to dance, tis not enough, no harshness gives offense. The sound must seem an echo of the sense. All right, you get the idea here? Line, uh, let's see, 363 here, right? So, right, 365. Okay, um, but that's the general principle. The sound must seem an echo of the sense. Now, Mr. Pope himself is a master of illustrating this, and he does this, all right, in various ways. In this, throughout this entire section, but also in the, in the particular section that I'm looking at. And this section goes from uh 360 to 373 okay so again true ease in writing comes from art not chance as those move easiest who have learned to dance tis not enough no harshness gives offense the sound must seem an echo of the sense what is he saying there tis not enough no harshness gives offense. We need to paraphrase that, right? It's not enough that there aren't any harsh sounds in the poem that might offend the ear, okay? There's more to um, the sound of poetry than simply pleasant sounds, is what he's saying, okay? It's, it isn't sufficient that there not be any harsh or unpleasant sounds, okay, that might offend the ear. So then he goes on, soft is the strain when Zephyr gently blows and the smooth stream in smoother numbers flows. Okay, now <laughs> let's, let's talk about those ears. All right, I can describe in technical terms all of the different sound effects in poetry. All right, I have you know, enough understanding of that that I can explain these things so that you could have the idea and you could even repeat some kind of definition if I were to ask you to define assonance or if I were to ask you to define consonance or alliteration or onomatopoeia or anything like this. You could do that, but that's not enough. You've got to be able to hear it. This is the important thing. And if you can't hear these things, then I'm wasting my time, okay? So I want you to hear what Pope is doing with that line, 366. Soft is the strain when Zephyr gently blows, and then the next line, and the smooth stream and smoother numbers flows. What is he doing? He's writing a line about streams that flow, right? Water flowing by. And, and he's talking about, he's not talking about a rough stream with all kinds of crashing water, right? He's not talking about the sound of waves on a beach or anything like that. He's talking about a smoothly flowing stream. Well, can you hear the smooth sounds here? The smooth stream in smoother numbers flows. That's what you've got to be able to hear. Now we could talk about the vowels there. We could talk about the way the words elide, that is the way they connect to each other. We could talk about those M sounds and so on. So we could describe this, but describing it's not going to do you any good if you can't really hear it. Okay, and he goes on. But, but, okay, now he's going to contrast this. He's been talking about smooth sounds, right? And by the way, he says smoother numbers. Numbers simply refers to the meter of the poem. We don't, we don't use that word anymore, but that's what it means, you know, in Pope's time. He's just talking about the meter, and we'll, we'll get to meter in a little while here, all right? But now he's going to contrast this, all right? If you want to write about a smooth flowing stream, then you've got to use smooth sounds, right? But, 
when loud surges lash the sounding shore the hoarse rough verse should like the torrent roar okay all right so what if what if the water is no longer any smooth right what if the water is crashing around okay well then then the then the sound must be an echo of the sense the sound of the poem has to be rough too so can you hear this but when the loud surges lash the sounding shore all right using sibilants there the s sounds right like the sound of the sea the sounding shore and so on the hoarse rough verse should like the torrent's roar okay sound must be an echo of the sense okay so you've got the general idea here right onomatopoeia okay sound and sense and you've got to be able to hear it so let's um let's move on uh to a couple of topics that i mentioned here rhyme and alliteration what i want to say about rhyme is this first of all that we're not really going to talk about the details of rhyme in this lecture we'll be doing that when we get to the subject of form in lyric poetry but it what i want to say is that it's very common to think that poetry is the stuff that rhymes forget it that's not true rhyme does not define poetry we are familiar with rhyme because rhyme for a long time was a dominant feature of poetry and it is still a dominant feature of the lyrics in popular songs okay songs tend to rhyme we all know that but rhyme is in the whole roughly 5000 year history of literature rhyme is a fairly recent invention now recent maybe in the last thousand years or so okay in the last 800 years i'm going to say roughly okay um, but 800 years, the last 800 years out of the last 5,000 years is a relatively short period of time. So we can say that in the whole history of poetry, the whole history of literature, rhyme is a recent invention. Okay, so do not equate rhyme with poetry. It does not define poetry. It can be a prominent feature of poetry, but there's a lot more to it than that. So that's all i'm going to say about rhyme in this lecture uh, the other topic that i mentioned was alliteration okay alliteration is the repetition of sounds in words all right so let's see if we've got an example of alliteration here uh, in pope uh, let's see so well, I mentioned those sibilants, and so the repetition, the repetition of the S sound is a special kind of alliteration called sibilance. All right. Sound must seem an echo of the sense. Okay, so you've got the repetition of those S sounds there. That's alliteration. But again, we're going to talk about alliteration uh, later on when we talk about uh, form in poetry so we'll set that aside for the time being what we really need to focus on now now that you understand onomatopoeia right now that you understand the sound being an echo of the sense we're going to talk about meter all right now you know what rhythm is you know what rhythm is because rhythm is so important again getting back to music and getting back to popular music because you can hear the beat all right and the beat goes on okay so you know what the beat is whether it's hip-hop whether it's country western whether it's rock and roll right whether it's motown whether it's blues whatever it happens to be whatever your genre of music okay you know that there is a beat to it and when we talk about meter that's what we're talking about we're talking about beat but we're talking about meter beat in the sense of measuring the beat measuring the accent in a line of poetry and in the poem as a whole so meter simply means to measure something 
All right. So if we're measuring and what we're measuring is that beat, that repetition of an accented sound. OK, when we measure that, that means we've got meter now. For the most part, not always, but for the most part in English poetry, when we talk about meter, we're talking about measuring accent. We're talking about measuring stress. And I'll try to define that for you in a second. And the second thing we're talking about measuring is the number of syllables. We go by line. Now, in poetry, the line is simply that sequence of words that begins at the left-hand margin and goes toward the right, and then at some point toward the right, it moves toward the right. We read from left to right, right? Okay, so at some point, that line of words is going to stop, and then we're going to move down to the next line of words or row of words. That's called a line. So when we talk about meter, what we're doing is we are measuring the pattern of stressed and unstressed syllables in a line. And then secondly, we're measuring the number of syllables in a line and they go together. All right. Now, again, if this is something that, you know, you're not picking up from me the first time around. It is explained in chapter 11. But let me go on. Okay, so what do we mean by accent or stress? This is simple. You know this from using a dictionary. You go to a dictionary and you're trying to figure out how to pronounce a word perhaps that's unfamiliar to you. You can you look at the word as it's printed in the dictionary and the dictionary will tell you which syllable gets the stress. What do we mean by that? Stress simply means the syllable that is pronounced a little bit louder, okay? And also the pitch is a little bit higher, okay? Now, I've just said two words in a way that I hope will illustrate this point I'm making about accent or stress. Higher, okay? H-I-G-H-E-R. It's a word of two syllables, which syllable gets the stress? The first one, right? Because you could hear me say that. Higher. Now, no, in normal speech, I wouldn't put quite so much stress on the stressed syllable, right? But I'm doing that for purposes of illustration. The same thing with louder. I say that the stressed or the accented syllable is said somewhat louder. Okay, again, L-O-U-D-E-R, two-syllable word, right? Syllable, by the way, is defined by the vowel. You've got a vowel for each syllable. So, lao, okay? Ao is the vowel there. That gives us the first syllable. Dur, er is the vowel in that second syllable. So, we say we've got two syllables there, all right? Because we've got two sequences of letters that are controlled by that vowel sound. So I say that the accent in L-O-U-D-E-R is on the first syllable, louder, okay? Now, now that's all pretty obvious to you. Where it gets complicated and where a lot of people have some difficulty is in hearing that as a sequence of sounds in a line of poetry, okay? So that's what we need to look at. Let's go back to Mr. Pope, okay? And I'll tell you, talk, uh, uh, try to illustrate <laughs> in, in these lines we've already looked at, illustrate what we mean by the meter, okay? Now you understand accent, all right? You understand syllables. We're measuring a pattern okay of accents and syllables and what do we mean by a pattern a pattern is simply the repetition of something right okay so what did we have here with our definition of rights our definition of onomatopoeia here from mr pope lines uh 364 and 365 tis not enough no harshness gives offense the sound must seem an echo of the sense Okay, now that I've said, I've read that fairly normally, normal tone of voice.
but I want to bring out the rhythm. Tis not enough, no harshness gives offense. The sound must seem an echo of the sense. The sound must seem an echo of the sense. All right. Now, what have I done there? This is a fairly easy line to use to explain meter because the accents are pretty obvious. Okay, take the two one-syllable words, the and sound. Now, when you say them, sound's the important word there, isn't it? So you would say, the sound. Okay, you wouldn't say, the sound. Okay, all right. Second pair of words, must, must and seem. Must seem. Seem is, again, the more important word there. It's, it's the verb, right? Okay, must is just a helping word. Okay, must just goes, you know, along as an adverb to modify a seem. The sound must seem an echo to the sense. Okay, or that first line, tis not enough. No harshness gives offense. Okay. How do we know what the accent is on in that line? It has a lot to do with the accent in the words themselves. Now, some of these words are one-syllable words. So you have to say, well, where's the accent going to go in a one-syllable word? Well, it goes on that one syllable, doesn't it? But then you've got two-syllable words, enough, harshness, and offense. Enough. Okay, accent on the second syllable, harshness, accent on the first syllable, offense, accent on the second syllable, and so on. So you start to identify where the accents would go in two ways. Okay, the accent in the individual words, and then the accent the way it would normally be said. So in normal speech, we would give emphasis to the important words, less emphasis or less stress or accent on the less important words like articles, the and a, uh, or prepositions of and to and for and so on. That's the way it works. Now, let's look at, and I'm going to have to bring this up here because I don't, don't have it uh in the book um so let's see i want to look at mending wall and so i need to bring it up here sorry i should have done this um before i started the lecture but i didn't so here we go um mending wall drilling down here in my directory to mr robert frost and we bring up mending wall this uh, poem as you know um, is in your uh the handout of the three additional poems for uh unit three mending wall um, goes like this, okay? Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it, and spills the upper boulders in the sun, and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. The work of hunters is another thing. I have come after them and made repair where they have left not one stone on a stone, but they would have the rabbit out of hiding. Frost is writing in the same meter that um, Alexander Pope is writing in. The meter is called iambic pentameter, and so I need to explain what an iam is. An iam is two syllables. Remember, we said that uh, we 
a meter is the measure of a particular pattern. And what we're doing here is we're measuring the pattern of uh, syllables and stresses. Well, an I am is a two syllable unit, okay, with the stress on the second syllable in the unit. Now, Frost writes a fairly sophisticated kind of iambic pentameter in which not all of the lines follow a strict pattern. But let me illustrate what the strict pattern is so that you can understand the way in which Frost is deviating from that pattern. So let's take the second line of Mending Wall. This, is, this second line is pretty close to a strict iambic pentameter line. Okay, I'm going to read it in a way that brings out that particular metrical pattern that sends the frozen ground swell under it. Okay, that sends the frozen ground swell under it. Okay, so let's break that down into iams. First two syllables, that sends. Second two syllables, the froze, right? Third two syllables, n ground, right? A third two syllables, swell un, and fourth two syllables, I'm sorry, and then the fifth two syllables, dir it. So first, that sends, okay? Remember what I said about Important word gets the stress. You got two one syllable words there, two syllables. Okay. The sec the, the second word is the important one that gets the emphasis. That sends. Uh second pair of syllables, the froze, right? Okay. Well, take the word frozen. Frozen, right? Accent on the first syllable. Frozen. Okay, so it's going to be, you take those two syllables together, the froze, okay? Now, frozen, second syllable, N, is not accented, right? So you've got N, which is not accented, but then you've got the word ground, which is accented. So you've got your third pair is N ground, okay? So that sends the frozen ground swell under it that sends the frozen ground swell under it okay now i've read that in a way that brings out the accent that would not be a normal speaking voice but what happens is the ear captures the underlying rhythm now rhythm what do we mean by rhythm Rhythm is the overall sound that is created by a particular metrical pattern. Okay? So, let's look at another line here. Um, fifth line. The work of hunters is another thing. Okay? Or, um, fifth, seventh line. Uh, uh, we let me see, eighth line, the one, let's see, the work of hunters is another thing that's a fairly even uh, iambic pentameter line. Um, and then I want uh, the one that goes there, but they would have the rabbit out of hiding. Um, another one that's fairly regular iambic line, but they would have the rabbit out of hiding. Okay, there's an extra syllable there. Um, okay, so you get the general idea. What then is uh, an iambic pentameter line? What do we mean by pentameter? You now know what an iamb is, right? An iamb is two syllables together, second syllable gets the stress. Pentameter refers to the number of iams in the line, or the number of whatever's they are. We're talking about iams. There are other kinds of um, metrical feet, 
as we call them in, in meter. We're talking about iambs. So, iambic pentameter, we're talking about a sequence of two-syllable feet, right? With two-syllable units. And pentameter means there are five of them. So you've got five iams in the line. Okay? So if you've got five iams in the line, you tell me how many syllables there are. If there are two syllables to an iam and there are five iams in a line, okay, you get the picture, right? So we're measuring syllables, iambic pentameter, five iams, ten syllables to the line. Okay? Um, I want to talk about, um, in closing here, I want to talk about some other aspects of, um, of meter. Um, let me give you, just by way of variation, um, another example of a metrical line, and that would be iambic tetrameter. And again, I'm going to use Robert Frost as an example of this poem that you know pretty well by now, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. Listen to the difference in the sound of the lines in this poem. Difference from a poem uh, like Mending Walls. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that sends the frozen ground swell under it, okay? And contrast that with the sound of this poem. Whose woods these are, I do not know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. Same basic metrical unit, right? The unstressed word or unstressed syllable followed by the stressed syllable. Whose woods these are, I think, I know. That's one line. His house is in the village, though. Okay? All right. So you've got the same basic unit, the I am, I-A-M-B, but there are only four of them eight syllables instead of ten, and it seriously changes the sound of the line. The iambic pentameter line is the dominant line in the works of Shakespeare, okay? It is one of the commonest lines, metrical lines, in English poetry. Um, it's almost like the, the daddy, if you will, or the mommy of all of English meter. It's the basic meter. And the I am is the basic metrical unit. Okay, it's the most common, the most popular. But there are important variations. The tetrameter line, tetra means four. Penta means five, right? As in pentagon, five sides, okay? So tetra, four, means four I am's, iambic tetrameter, um, penta means five, iambic pentameter, there are five iams. Okay, going to wrap this up by pointing out two things. First of all, um, there are poems in which every line has the same metrical pattern, and we just looked at three of them. The selection from Alexander Pope, um, Frost's Mending Wall, and Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening, all of the lines have exactly the same metrical pattern, whether it's iambic pentameter or iambic tetrameter. But not all poems do. Metrical poems, a poem can be metrical, but have lines of different lengths. So let's look at... A poem that does that, and this would be uh, Mr. John Donne's uh, The Sun Rising, which is on page uh, 472. By the way, I should have told you, uh, Stopping by Woods is on page uh, 677. And so we're now moving to page 4, 
72 if I can find it here okay and this is an example no it's not on page 472 where did I no ah, I can't I can't read the numbers here sorry folks I was on 572 472 okay Uh, the Sun Rising. Now, this is an example of a poem that is written in iams. Okay, the rhythm, the meter is iambic, but they're not all the same length. Okay. Busy old fool, unruly sun, why dost thou thus? Did you hear that? Why dost thou thus too? Right? Four syllables, why dost thou thus? Through windows and through curtains call on us. Iambic pentameter, right? So, what about that, those first two lines? Busy old fool, unruly son. Um, I'm, I'm not going to try to explain that first line to you because it's a fairly comp complicated variation on the basic pattern. But the second line, why dost thou thus? Two iams, that's iambic dimeter. D-I meaning two, okay? And then, so we've got, we've got a line of two iams, relatively short, right? And then we've got a line through windows and through curtains, call on us, iambic pentameter, and so on and so forth. Um, you can look at it yourself and see how Dunn is varying the length of the lines in this poem. So it is metrical in the sense that there is a regular recurring uh, metrical pattern, okay, and it's all basically iambic. There are some variations, but basically iambic, but um, it's all metrical, but the lines vary in length. The last example that I want to point out to you, okay, is what we call free verse. And free verse has no particular metrical pattern at all. Doesn't mean that there isn't some kind of rhythmic sound to it, but there is no regular meter. So we say that it is free verse because it is free of any regular metrical structure to it okay so we'll conclude with this is a poem that i did not assign for this unit um but it's by walt whitman it's called i hear america singing it's on page 719 okay in your book uh, norton introduction and uh, i'm bringing this poem in as an example because Walt Whitman is one of the pioneers in the use of free verse. That is verse that doesn't have a regular meter to it. Okay? I hear America singing. And what I want you to notice is, again, there's no particular pattern that stands out. A lot of variation in the length of the lines. The lines tend to be fairly long, but they don't fit into that neat Whose woods these are, I think, I know. His house is in the village, though he will not see me stopping here, etc., etc. Doesn't fit into that regular pattern, which would be sing-song, if you were to read it the way I just read it, right? That regular sing-song thing, okay? Goes like this. I hear America singing, the varied carols I hear. Those of mechanics, each one singing his as it should be, blithe and strong. That's all one line right there. Those of mechanics, each one singing his, as it should be, blithe and strong, right? Next line, the carpenter singing his. Okay, these are the varied carols. Carols meaning songs in this context, right? The carpenter singing his song, his carol, as he measures his plank or beam. The mason singing his as he makes ready for work or leaves off work. One line right? The boatman singing what belongs to him in his boat, the deckhand singing on the steamboat deck, all one line. No particular pattern to it, all right? Um, 
the shoemaker singing as he sits on his bench the hatter singing as he stands the woodcutter's song the ploughboy's on his way in the morning or at noon intermission or at sundown the delicious singing of the mother or of the young wife at work or of the girl sewing or washing each singing what belongs to him or her and to none else the day what belongs to the day at night the party of young men of young fellows robust friendly singing with open mouths clear their strong melodious songs now no regular metrical pattern free verse does that mean that there isn't any particular sound here well, there certainly is, and I hope you heard it. The obvious sound is the repetition of that noun phrase at the beginning of every line. Those of mechanics, the carpenter singing, the mason singing, right? The boatman singing, the shoemaker singing, etc., etc. Okay, so Whitman is establishing a pattern. Folks, that's all we have time for. We will be discussing uh, sound in poetry uh, in our uh, Unit 3 discussion forum. So I look forward to uh, hearing what you are reading. Okay, hearing, yes, it should be hearing. <laughs> try to hear the sounds of poetry. Read the poems out loud. Try to hear that pattern of accented and unaccented syllables say those accents to you to yourselves say them out loud so that you can hear that pattern right and when you do then you'll be hearing the meter you'll be hearing the sound of the poem thanks for listening and i'll see you online